Hello, my name is Dr. Jeff Calvert. I am the Associate Director of Clinical Quality at the World Trade Center Health Program, which is a division within NIOSH and CDC. It's my pleasure to, uh, and honor to welcome you to the fifth installment of the World Trade Center Health Program's Clinical Best Practices webinar series. Uh, please note that all of these best practices webinars are recorded, and those recordings will be available on the World Trade Center Health Program website. So today's webinar is titled, The Diagnosis and Treatment of Asthma. It will be presented by two esteemed pul pulmonologists who have longstanding affiliations with the World Trade Center Health Program. Dr. Denise Harrison will kick off the webinar. She is a pulmonologist, occupational medicine specialist, internist and medical director, and associate professor of medicine at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine. In addition, Dr. Joan Reidman is today's co-presenter. She is also a pulmonologist and internist and is a, a professor of medicine and environmental medicine at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine. So we have a few disclaimers. <clears throat> One is that the views expressed in the presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the official position of NIOSH or CDC. Second, mention of any trade names, commercial practices, or organizations does not imply endorsement by CDC NIOSH. And third, citations to websites external to CDC NIOSH does not constitute our endorsement of the sponsoring organization or their programs or products. Furthermore, NIOSH CDC is not responsible for the content of those external websites. And then finally, we have disclosures. So for the most part, um, there were no financial relationships declared within ed eligible companies, with the exception of Drs. Joan Reidman and uh, Dr. Delahose. Dr. Delahose is on the planning committee. Dr. Reidman wishes to disclose that she, <clears throat> excuse me, serves as a consultant for AstraZeneca, and Dr. Delahose wishes to disclose that within the past two years, he has attended promotional programs hosted by AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline, and received an lecture honorarium from Teva, Denmark. All these relevant financial relationships for these individuals have been mitigated. And I think without further ado, now we will go to the presentation by Drs. Harrison and Reidman. And Dr. Harrison, I think you'll be kicking off the, the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As, as Dr. Calvert mentioned, my name is um, Denise Harrison. I'm a physician at NYU. And um, I just wanted to say that um, given NYU's close proximity to Ground Zero, we knew early on that we would be involved in the care of those that were affected by the tragedy. So we began seeing patients immediately after 9-11 um, in the chest clinic and in the occupational medicine clinic that I was working on at the time. That's independent of the program, and we have been seeing patients um, within the World Trade Center Health Program since 2002. Um, uh, I just want to go over the goals of the talk. Um, first, I will we'll have a brief presentation on, on asthma as a World Trade Center certifiable disorder for responders and survivors, and I'll be going into a brief discussion in what we mean by responders and survivors and what's meant by a certifiable um, disorder. Uh, and then Joan, and then I'll be discussing also three cases. These cases are from both the responders and the survivors group. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Reitman will also be referring back to these cases um, when she did her part of the presentation, which was mainly giving updates in the treatment of asthma how we assess asthma control and severity within the program, the basic concept in pharmacological management, and the management of the difficult to treat and severe asthmatics, including, including those that are treated with target, targeted biologic therapy. So just to give you some background definition, um, what is a survivor? A survivor is a person who was present in the New York City disaster area or in the aftermath of I mean, in the New York City disaster area in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, as a result of their work, residence, or attendance at school, child care, or adult daycare. 
On the other hand, we have responders. A responder, or, a responder is defined as a worker or volunteer who provided rescue, recovery, demolition, debris removal, and other related support services in the aftermath of the September 11, 2000 attacks on the World Trade Center. This includes workers at Ground Zero, the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And examples of these um, include members of the police department, emergency healthcare workers, sanitation workers, engineering, Verizon workers, and stagehands who help light Ground Zero, to name a few. Um, so as you can see from this graph, asthma is the third most common non-cancer certification in the World Trade Center Health Program. So you can see highlighted in red, it follows, if you take cancer out, it's the third most common condition and follows behind um, diagnosis of GERD and chronic rhinosinusitis. Asthma was created as a World Trade Center certifiable condition based on its biologic plausibility and also based on extensive literature among World Trade Center symptoms, about World Trade Center symptoms, sorry. So we know um, from experience that respiratory disorders are common um, um, environmental and occupational diseases. So we expected very early on that exposure to the World Trade Center dust would lead to respiratory disorders such as asthma. And why is this so plausible? It's based on the, the dust composition. Um, and this data was gathered from the settled dust. Uh, the, the World Trade Center dust was overwhelming in that greater than 1 million tons of dust was generated. 90% of this dust were greater than 2.5 millimeters in air and dynamic diameter, and were more likely, to be, therefore, to be deposited in the upper airways. Less than 1%, a significantly smaller amount, was less than 2.5 millimeter in aerodynamic diameter. And this was more likely to be de deposited in conducting and lower or smaller airways. Another Im important feature of the dust was that it was highly alkaline with a pH of 9.0 to 11, and therefore had the potential to damage both upper and lower epithelium to activate inflammatory pathways, as well as to act as an airway irritant. So in, 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 in order for responders to get treatment in, in, in the program, they have to go through what's called a certification. And the, the, the World Trade Center Health Program Administrator gave, gives us a predetermined list of conditions that could be considered related to to um, the 9-11 exposure. If the treating provider makes the determination that an individual's 9-11 exposure is substantially likely to be a significant factor in aggravating, contributing to, or causing an individual's health condition, um, then they need to, to, to send in uh, the request for certification. And this is usually based on the assessment of two things the individual's exposure to airborne toxins, any other hazard, or any other adverse conditions resulting from the terrorist attack. It's also based on the type of symptoms and the temporal sequence of symptoms. Lower respiratory symptoms must have had an onset or worsened within five years after the last date of the 9-11 exposure. The last 9-11 exposure defined as to have occurred on July 31st, 2002. So in terms of exposures, um, both re responders and survivors have what we call acute and chronic um, exposures. Um, acute exposures and first responders mostly, mostly involve ex uh, those that were caught in the dust cloud or worked on the day of 9-11 and were um, and were exposed to a significant amount of dust on that day. Survivors also were caught in the dust cloud or, or, or also were in heavily dusty area on the day of 9-11. Alternatively, we have chronic exposures, which in responders um, were those that were involved in rescue and recovery 
And as I said, it goes, went on until June of 2002. Survivors include those who return to local workplaces, homes, or schools, uh, and lived in the area. So World Trade Center, asthma as a World Trade Center certifiable condition has, takes two forms. We have new onset asthma, new onset World Trade Center related asthma, or World Trade Center aggravated asthma. So now I'm going to present three cases, um, both from the responder group and from the survivor group. And as I said, um, these cases will be um, mentioned again when Dr. Reidman discusses the pharmacal, the management of, of, of asthma within our program. The first patient is a patient with new onset asthma that was mild. The, first, the patient first presented to the monitoring program in March of 2009 at the age of 39. She was an NYPD officer, denied any respiratory symptoms prior to 9-11. She developed symptoms within weeks of being at the site, reporting symptoms of cough, shortness of breath with exertion. She first saw her doctor for her symptoms in 2002 and was prescribed inhaled steroids that she continues to re require to control her symptoms to this day. Her symptoms initially were compl complicated by comorbid anxiety. She was placed um, on limited duty due, due to her anxiety um, related to 9-11 in 2004. She also um, had chronic nasal congestion and post-nasal drip that would often aggravate her respiratory symptoms. The next patient is a patient with World Trade Center aggravated asthma. The responder presented for his first monitoring visit in November of 2006. NYPD detective, age 42 at the time of presentation. He worked at the site from 9-12, so was not caught in the dust cloud, to September of 2000, to November of 2002, sorry. He was involved in search and rescue on the pit, was doing perimeter security, and sifting debris at the Staten Island landfill. Has a history of childhood asthma, and had what he called his last serious attack at age 26 and reported using albuterol as needed only twice a year in the year before 9-11. Within weeks of exposure, he developed symptoms of shortness of breath, chest tightness, and wheezing. He had to call in sick several days while at the site and saw his medical doctor in, in December of 2001, at which time he was prescribed inhaled steroids as well as albuterol, which he also continues to use today. And the next case is a patient with new onset severe asthma. This was a 57-year-old man with no significant medical history before 9-11. He was also a never smoker. On 9-11, he was working on the 55th floor of the World Trade Center Tower as an audiovisual technician. He was on his way downstairs for a break when the first plane hit. He was able to ex exit the building and was in the area when the building collapsed and was covered in dust returned to work at 60 Broad Street, which is a few minutes walk from ground zero, but could not tolerate it due to anxiety and had to quit. A few months after 9-11, he developed chronic cough and treated himself with over-the-counter medication. He eventually sought care and, told, and was told he had bronchitis and was treated with numerous courses of antibiotics. He also developed progressive shortness of breath, wheezing, chest nightmares and was eventually placed on bronchodilators and told he had COPD. He had numerous ED visits and for exacerbation and subsequently joined the World Trade Center Survivor Program in 2017. Also reported symptoms of nasal congestion and post-nasal drip that began in 2009. So I presented the cases and Dr. Reitman will go into um, diagnosis and management of asthma in our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that great introduction to how we think about asthma in the World Trade Center program. Can you all hear me? Someone has to say yes. <laughs> I hope yes. so. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks. So what I'm going to do next is really talk about how we think about both the diagnosis and management of asthma in our World Trade Center program, but also really based on general guidelines. And those guidelines have been created over many, many years. 
Uh, there are the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Guidelines, which were actually last formally um, published in 2007, so quite a long time ago. They then uh, had uh, an update for really just addressing certain questions in 2020. But when these guidelines were developed, uh, the, uh, the uh, physicians in Europe, as well as the United States, decided that they would get together and also make what's called the Global Initiative for Asthma Guidelines. And those, in fact, have been updated every year. And so the ones that we're talking about today are those that were based uh, and, and published in 2023. So in order to understand how we manage asthma in the World Trade Center program, we sort of really have to understand the definition because it's what complicates our ability to diagnose asthma. And according to the guidelines, asthma is defined as a disease with many variations, i.e. it's heterogeneous, usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation. And it has two key defining features, a history of symptoms such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough, that vary over time and intensity and variable expiratory airflow limitation. So what you're hearing really is that it's a disease that's diagnosed by the clinical history, i.e. the presence of variable symptoms that come and go, or in fact, maybe chronic, as well as the ability to obtain objective evidence uh, or the attempt to obtain objective evidence of variable expiratory airflow limitation and later on, we'll talk about some of the ways in which we can also measure some of the inflammation. But it is predominantly a clinical diagnosis with uh, uh, attempts to obtain some objective evidence that helps put the whole story together. And indeed, we think about clinical symptoms uh, and think about them very carefully. And we think that there's an increased probability if you have the symptoms of wheeze, shortness of breath, cough, chest tightness, and if you have more than one symptom, it's more likely to be asthma. But certainly we are always thinking about our differential diagnosis for cardiac disease, COPD, or other lung diseases. The symptoms are often worse at night or early in the morning. And when, you know, I'm a New Yorker. When, when I first learned this, I thought that wasn't true. I thought it was really the garbage trucks came out at night and woke everybody up. But it really is. There are circadian rhythms that can uh, exacerbate these symptoms. And the symptoms vary over time and in intensity. Importantly, symptoms are triggered by many, many things. For most people, viral infections are the most common cause of an asthma exacerbation, but certainly exercise, allergen exposure, changes in the weather, and even laughter can cause exacerbations. For our population, one of the things we see a lot is that many of our patients will complain that irritants such as cleaning materials or smoke or strong smells will also aggravate or worsen their symptoms, something to think about in your patients. The classic way we measure variable expiratory airflow limitation is with spirometry, which is a standard procedure we do as part of surveillance uh, in the World Trade Center program. And this is an old uh, uh, um, image that we see. This is tidal volume breathing normally. This is a deep breath in. This is you blow out hard and fast. And what you can see is this should be where this patient hits in terms of the pattern that they make, but you see significant obstruction in this patient. And when we give this patient a bronchodilator, you can see that there's improvement, significant improvement by the shape of this curve, although it doesn't reach normal. And this is what we call bronchodilator reversibility. And we have standard definitions, which up until recently uh, were called a 12% improvement in forced expiratory volume in one second, how fast you can blow the air out. But recently there's been new definitions uh, and how we've incorporated this in the program yet, I think we're still in debate. Uh, this is a whole um, uproar about how we're looking at our spirometry, uh, but this old way was a 12% improvement. There are now new definitions that are, are being discussed extensively. So we look for that in all our patients, but indeed in the World Trade Center patients, as well as in our non-World Trade Center asthma patients, we may not always be able to show bronchodilator reversibility. And this can be because there's fixed airflow due to airway remodeling, one of the changes we see in the airways of patients with asthma. And so you won't see that beautiful improvement with a bronchodilator. It may also be that just at that moment, the patient is not showing bronchodilator reversibility. You might need to repeat that testing during symptoms or after withholding all their medications. It could also be that you're not seeing reversibility because the patient was too severe at that moment. 
So there are a number of reasons why you may not see that reversibility, suggesting you might want to repeat the studies um, uh, if you can. There are also alternative approaches we can use. Sometimes we do what's called peak flow measurements to give us peak flow variability, which they can do at home. We can also test a patient for airway hyperresponsiveness, where we in fact have them inhale a chemical that um, triggers uh, bronco, bronchospasm in the airway. And we can measure that with a chemical called methacholine and also in the old days, mannitol. In our program and in others, we've also tried other ways to look for um, these airway limitations. And we looked a lot, at, uh, we studied a lot looking for small airway uh, abnormalities using something called impulse oscillometry, um, which we've published extensively about. The point being that it may be difficult to really show that airflow limitation and reversibility. And so we try a whole different slew of approaches to find it. Indeed, in the World Trade Center population, many did or do not have easily demonstrable bronchodilator responses. Um, we can do methacholine challenges, but these are cumbersome and they may not always be positive at that moment. Uh, and as I said before, we, we can look for small airway measures, but again, this is not that well standardized and it's something that we just put in our pot or in our basket of all the tools we can have to assess these patients. And very often we really need to rely on the clinical history and the response to medications, i.e. you put someone on the medicines and you ask them, do they feel better? And this becomes sometimes uh, the only way that we can really sometimes assess what's going on. So if you look at our first patient, this was a patient who had mild asthma. This patient had a forced vital capacity, how much air they could blow out. It was 87% predicted, which is normal. He had, uh, she had a forced expiratory volume in one second, how fast she could blow it out, that was 80% predicted, and the normal ratio of FEV1 to FEC. And indeed, after bronchodilator, this patient did not show a change uh, in airflow consistent with uh, our definition of reversibility. So in fact, uh, what Dr. Harrison didn't tell you is this patient went on and had a methacholine challenge test. And indeed, you can see here that she's being given increasing doses of methacholine and drops her FEV1. And she had a positive methacholine chest, uh, test consistent with airway hyperreactivity. So she had this done. It's not something we do all the time, but this patient had this done and it was nicely, it was helpful in terms of her diagnosis. Our patient number two uh, had a forced vital capacity that was 84% predicted, normal an FEV1 that was 81%, and an FEV1 over FVC. Sorry, can you still hear me? Sorry, yeah. Yes. Can you still hear me? Okay, yes. good, thanks. An FEV1 over FVC that was normal. Despite this, what I'm not showing you is these values. This patient had a huge bronchodilator response with a 16% improvement. So this patient had our classic lung function findings. So these are just two examples of what you might find in some of these World Trade Center patients. As we're thinking about these patients, the next question is, how are we gonna treat them? And again, we're gonna do this based on the asthma guidelines that I told you about earlier. And perhaps one of the most important things to come out of these guidelines, and maybe if this is all you take home today, this would be very, the key thing, is that when you start to assess a patient with asthma, once you think you've made your diagnosis, the first thing you want to understand is how active is that asthma? What is the control or what we call asthma control for that patient? And that consists of two components. One is impairment or the frequency and intensity of symptoms and functional limitations. How many days out of the week is that patient having wheezing, shortness of breath, coughing, chest tightness? How far are they able to walk? Can they do their activities of daily living? That's what we call impairment, which is really, really critical. The other thing is almost a little different, and that's risk. And that's the likelihood of future asthma attacks or even progressive decline in lung function. And this is slightly different uh, because they don't quite tell us the same thing. Control status needs to be measured at every visit because asthma is a variable disease. So you really need to assess it every time you see that patient. And our medication management starts and is adjusted based on control status. So it's really key. 
We like to use quantitative or standardized ways to do that. And the reason for that is that providers and patients are notorious for their ability to overestimate control. And there was a really beautiful study in 2012 uh, in which they did a telephone survey of individuals and asked them, how's your asthma? And most of them said, 70% said they were well controlled or completely controlled. So 30% said, I'm not controlled. In contrast, when they asked the same patients, and I'm sorry, the providers were very similar too, their answers were very similar to the patients. Uh, when they asked very specific questions, it turned out that in fact, 70% were uncontrolled. In other words, there's a real discordance between what someone will say, how they feel, versus if you really ask specific questions, how they really feel. And there are standardized instruments to assess asthma control. This is a very common one. It's been well validated. It's used all over the place. It's the asthma control test. It's a self-administered, five-item, four-week recall, Likert scale test. It doesn't always work in our clinic. We consider it a very good literacy test. Um, but uh, it's been studied in many, many other situations. It's available in multiple languages. You can do it by mail or by telephone. And a score of less than 20 is considered uncontrolled. And I use this all the time, not as my only tool, but as a tool that will help me figure out, am I off target or on target when I'm trying to assess the control of this patient? Control is different from severity. When we talk about someone having mild asthma or severe asthma, that's different than control. Severity describes the intrinsic nature of the disease. And now, according to the new guidelines, different than the old guidelines, severity is assessed retrospectively from the level of treatment that's required to control symptoms and exacerbations. So this is very different than the old NIH guidelines where we only based it on symptoms and it didn't take medicines into control into account and so we all got confused. This now says you don't assess severity immediately. You assess control, you step up or down your medications and you decide what do I need to control this patient and then you assess severity. So for example, you could have mild asthma that can be controlled with just as needed or low dose medication, patient number one. You might have severe asthma that may or may not be controlled. In other words, it requires a lot of treatment and that treatment may make your patient controlled. So when you see them, they're asymptomatic, but they're requiring multiple medications. So that's severe asthma that's well controlled. Or you can have severe asthma that despite all the medications in your toolbox, that patient remains uncontrolled. So that's severe asthma that's uncontrolled. So two different things that you want to really think about when you're assessing your patient. Once we do that, we have a whole panoply of medications. And I show you this picture here because this is what we use in our clinics all the time. Because if you look at these, look at all the different inhalers we have, look at how they all look the same, look at how they're completely confusing, look at how some of them you breathe in one way, others you need to breathe in another way. So when your pharmacy benefit plan makes you change your inhaler, it's a very big deal. You can understand why we go crazy <laughs> when we have coordination benefits or when we have a pharmacy benefit plan that says, I'm not covering this one, I'm covering this one. They're not necessarily the same. They're not necessarily used the same way. They're very confusing to the patient. So it's a very big deal. The medications we have are short acting beta agonists, which are bronchodilator reliever medicines. We call them SABAs. That's what you see on this first row up here. Look at all the different colors, shapes, that they have inhaled corticosteroids, which are anti-inflammatory controllers. Look at those here. They look pretty similar, don't they? A muscarinic antagonist, which is a bronchodilator shown here, used in very different ways. You inhale them very differently. And combination inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilators. A whole slew of them here, all different shapes, sizes, forms. You breathe them all in differently. And then what I'll touch on at the end, we now also have biologic therapies which are provided as injections. So let's look at how we would use these very quickly. For our first patient, this was a patient who had minimal symptoms, but was eventually placed on chronic low dose inhaled corticosteroids and as needed short acting beta agonists. Very standard treatment for that time uh, and would be considered um, really standard of care. And let's look at that now according to the current GINA guidelines, which I show you here, where you can see they have step-up in therapy, 
what you would give to control your patient and also what you give for fast relief. And indeed this patient was, we would call this now step two, low dose maintenance inhaled corticosteroid and a short acting beta agonist for fast relief. Standard therapy then and sort of standard therapy now. There are problems with this though, which is that we know that very few patients really will do that low dose maintenance ICS. We know that the adherence to that is very, very difficult. So what you're seeing there is in the old days, we would give everybody a short acting beta agonist. Here I'm showing you all the different colors to show you how confusing it is for fast relief. But now there are some changes in that that I think are really, really important to understand which are the current recommendations are that we now focus on what we call anti-inflammatory reliever therapy. That is as needed, as needed bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory inhaler every time we give someone an agent for fast relief. So that's really a sea change from what we used to do uh, and what we've done for many, many, many years. So how do we do that? Well, that could be, for example, in this patient, who could take their low dose maintenance inhaled corticosteroid and their as needed short acting beta agonist as needed for fast relief, or that might take their inhaled corticosteroid every time their short acting beta agonist is taken as needed. So you just give that inhaled corticosteroid and the short acting beta agonist as needed. And now there is a new combination ICS SABA that has just been FDA approved that one could do that with. So a different approach one could think about in this patient. Alternatively, the guidelines, the GINA guidelines recommend a very different approach, which is the use of combination therapy, inhaled corticosteroid plus formoterol, which is a fast acting but long acting beta agonist that's available in two different combinations, which I'll go over. And what they recommend is that you use that as needed. So you're only putting someone on an as-needed ICS for moderal dose. And for fast release, that's what you're using. So this is very different than how we trained and how we were used to treating our asthmatics. And this has changed really in the last few years. This approach is not currently FDA approved because of the formulation of the ICS for moderal, but it is guideline recommended. It's also recommended in our NIH guidelines where they say you could put someone on as needed short acting beta agonist or more likely step two, which would be a daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid and as needed short acting beta agonist, a patient, or as needed ICS inhaled corticosteroid and a short acting beta agonist. So again, what we're saying here is that our new approach is that all patients require a bronchodilator for fast relief. They love that, that's their pump, they will not go without that, but that should be given always with an anti-inflammatory agent. And it can be given as an ICS plus formoderal combination as needed. It can be given as an ICS and a short acting beta agonist as two inhalers, or it can be given as our new combination ICS short acting beta agonist, or it can be given as chronic inhaled corticosteroid along with a short acting beta agonist as our first patient was treated with. No matter what you do, you're gonna to have to review, assess and adjust and see that patient back. Is this working? Is this not working for them? And if we come to that, we could take our patient number two who had World Trade Center aggravated asthma. And this patient had uncontrolled symptoms, spirometry consistent with asthma and was in fact placed on inhaled steroid and then eventually on combination therapy. And here are our combination uh, agents. And I show you this because although we call them combination inhaled steroid and long acting beta agonists, they're all controllers, but they are not equivalent. And that's again very important with coordination of benefits and with our pharmacy benefit plan, and it makes us crazy. So here we have our slow onset beta agonist uh, agents that we're all used to the purple disc, right? Adver, we know this well, fluticasone and salmeterol. These work slowly to prevent and control asthma and are even available as once a day. In contrast, we have controllers, which are combination medicines that consist of an inhaled corticosteroid and formoterol. And formoterol is a rapid onset long acting beta agonist. So this can be used for control, but because of its fast onset of action, 
can also be used for fast relief. So that's why we use budesonide and formaterol, commercially known as Simbacort, or mometazone and formaterol, commercially known as Dulera, as both controllers and as relievers. And again, these are guideline approved, but not yet FDA approved. So the older approach was to put someone on an inhaled corticos uh, on a combination therapy, as shown here, a, a, a long acting beta agonist uh, with ICS. It could also be the, any of these agents to control their therapy to be used daily in the morning and in the evening with a short acting beta agonist for fast relief or now even a short acting beta agonist and, a short acti and an inhaled corticosteroid for fast relief. So that's how we would think about this now. Alternatively, the approach that is again used uh, according to the guidelines, but not FDA approved, is we would do something called maintenance and reliever therapy or SMART or MART therapy. This can only be done with an inhaled corticosteroid and formaterol, shown in these pictures, and there again, we give this daily to prevent and control symptoms, but also use the same medicine as needed for fast relief. So here we're now saying we're using the same medicine to prevent and control and for fast relief. Importantly, if we're gonna do this, we need to make sure they have enough of these inhalers uh, to last them so that usually one inhaler does not last for the month. Now, no matter what you're going to do, you still got to review and assess and adjust this patient and see what happens. So let's go to our third patient. This patient had no uh, asthma before 9-11, but within months began having progressive cough, shortness of breath, uh, and uh, eventually wheezing, was uh, seen by outside people and told he had bronchitis and even told he had COPD. I don't know what that was based on. Um, he also developed subsequently upper airway symptoms of nasal congestion, post-nasal drip. His spirometry was normal. He did not have a bronchodilator response. There was no evidence of COPD when we did it on his first visit here. He did interestingly have impulse oscillometry or IOS measures of small airways that were abnormal. And those in fact showed a bronchodilator response. But given his clinical symptoms, Given uh, what he was telling us, we thought he had uh, perhaps difficult to, we thought he had asthma, we thought it was going to be difficult to treat. We also thought he had comorbid PTSD and chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyposis because he went to an ENT doctor. So difficult to treat asthma is asthma that's uncontrolled despite prescribing uh, medium or high dose inhaled corticosteroids and a second controller, a long acting beta agonist may in fact even require oral corticosteroids, or that requires high dose treatment to maintain good symptom control. There are many things that may make it difficult to treat. It may be because of the disease or because of modifiable factors such as incorrect inhaler technique, poor adherence, smoking, comorbid conditions, or very often because the diagnosis is incorrect. So what we always need to do is make sure the patient is using the medicine appropriately, check technique, check, give them a spacer if they need it, check adherence, review modifiable and occupational exposures, manage comorbid conditions, and please refer these patients to specialty providers. And indeed, the comorbid conditions we think about, particularly in our World Trade Center population, remember, large particles, they're landing in the upper airways. Many of these patients have comorbid sinusitis, sinusitis, can't say it, uh, rhinitis with or without nasal polyps. Many of them have comorbid OSA. They may have vocal cord dysfunction as well. Of course, many of them have GERD. Obesity is a big issue. Many of them may have developed bronchiectasis, even with co-infection with non-tuberculous microbacteria. They may have fixed airflow obstruction, whether they smoked or didn't smoke, they might get fixed airflow obstruction consistent with COPD. Want to always watch additional environmental exposures, psychological factors, both as we showed in patient one and patient three, where anxiety, depression, and PTSD were quite prominent. And always think of other diagnoses. Many of these patients have gone on to develop, not many, but a fair number have gone on to develop uh, to be diagnosed with sarcoidosis. So this patient was treated with high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilators and nasal steroids and saline. He could not tolerate antimuscarinics. 
His issues with adherence, which he had initially, were reviewed. Um, he uh, initiated mental health treatment for PTSD. He was treated for chronic rhinitis and sinusitis symptoms, as I said before. Despite all of that, he remained asymptomatic with an asthma control test of 10, which is uncontrolled, and he reported daily wheezing, quite significant exercise limitation, and in fact had multiple exacerbations a year requiring prednisone. So he had severe asthma, which is a subset of difficult to treat asthma, and that's asthma that's uncontrolled despite adherence with maximal optimized high-dose inhaled corticosteroid lab treatment and management of all these other factors. And so he's a patient that would get stepped up to step five. We would add on a long-acting anti-muscarinic, which in fact he couldn't tolerate. But then we might start trying to say, what kind of asthma does he really have? And here is very quickly uh, a, a, a cartoon, which I made, I drew it, of mechanisms of asthma, high and low type two disease. What we talk about is that there are many triggers for asthma and onset of exacerbations that include allergens, viruses, pollutants, World Trade Center dust, obesity, microbe, and what all of these can do is actually activate and even damage the airway epithelium. And that elicits the release of signals called alarmants, such as thymic stromal lymphopoietin or IL-33, and also can go on to generate uh, elevated levels of various mediators in the body. And those include IgE, which we often see in patients who are allergic, or interleukin-5, which recruits and activates eosinophil. There are also patients who don't have any of these signals that we can measure at the moment. And these are patients who have asthma with either low or non-T2 pathways. So we think about asthma as that having high type 2 pathways, which could be IgE or eosinophil, and those which have a low or non-type 2 pathway. And we can do some pretty coarse clinical measurements to help us assess that. That includes blood tests, which show absolute blood eosinophils, which we obtain in a CBC with a differential cell count. We may need to repeat this as those levels may be variable. It may be low one day, high another. We can certainly measure total IgE, a measure of allergy. We can measure allergen-specific IgE for outdoor allergens, indoor allergens, mold allergens. And we can also, in some places, measure exhaled uh, nitric oxide, which may be helpful in certain situations. When we do that, this helps us think, what can we add on and how can we target biologic therapy for asthma? And we now have a number of biologics that are available to us, which is actually unbelievably exciting for those of us in the asthma world. They include those that target IgE or anti-IgE, that's omalizumab, which we can use for severe asthma, also in patients with nasal polyposis or urticaria. Those that target IL-5 or eosinophil, uh, those are used for severe eosinophilic asthma and also sometimes in those who have uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. Those that target a different pathway, uh, the IL-4 receptor, which is, uh, uh, is, is a receptor for both IL-13 and IL-4, and that's dupilumab which is available for those with severe asthma, and also one that targets TSLP, thymic stromal lymphopoietin, which is tezepelumab, which is also useful in severe asthma. So there's a lot of these out now. They have, we use them in different situations. So this patient, our last patient, had uh, repeat PFTs that showed normal spirometry, uh, this time now on repeat uh, with a 12% improvement. He had normal imaging. We were concerned about other comorbid conditions. He went to ENT. He had no nasal polyposis. His laboratory values were notable for an elevated IgE, which was positive for indoor allergens, cockroach, mites, that's New York City for you, trees and grasses, but negative to mold, cats, and dogs. And he had an absolute eosinophil count of 670 cells per microliter, which is very, very elevated. So we thought he had severe persistent uncontrolled asthma, high T2 with elevated eosinophils and an IgE, and we put him on mepolizumab, which is an anti-IL-5 or eosinophil agent, monthly injections, and he today feels fantastic. His asthma control test is 20 to 25. He has no daytime or nocturnal symptoms. He can walk 10 blocks. He's maintaining an active job. 
Uh, he has been maintained on smart therapy, ICS for moderal. Um, and at one point he required one course of prednisone when he was exposed to uh, smoke from a residential fire. And his current diagnosis is severe persistent, high T2 asthma, well controlled on all these agents. So in summary, what we tried to do today quickly and speaking fast is talk about our criteria for World Trade Center related asthma certification, new onset or aggravated uh, that requires both exposure and onset of symptoms within defined time periods. Talk about how the diagnosis requires a clinical assessment and attempts to identify airflow reversibility, how treatment requires assessment of control and severity, how all patients should be given an anti-inflammatory agent along with the bronchodilator for fast relief as well as control, and how patients with difficult to treat and or severe asthma should be referred to a specialist for treatment of asthma and comorbid conditions, including a phenotypic assessment for stepwise increase in therapy, such as targeted biologic therapy. And I'm gonna stop here and thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. And happy so to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Reibman and Dr. Saracen for an excellent and very clear presentation. So now Ann Riddle has, um, has received some questions that she is now going to read to you. Thank you. Take it away, Ann. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reibman and Dr. Harrison for your presentation. Um, do you have any insight on members with co comorbidities with COVID-19 and or long COVID-19? That is, how is this affecting their existing asthma condition? Dr. Harrison, you want to take that or you want me to take that? Um, we could both take it. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the uh, issues we have complicating findings now in our World Trade Center cohort. And um, in, in my cohort so far, we most, the issue we're having now is, is patients presenting with abnormal pulmonary function tests who did not have asthma and now want certification because they meet the certification for COPD. But I have not found that overall a lot of our patients who had pre-existing asthma have been worsened after COVID. We just have patients that have developed symptoms after COVID and now want certification. So I so, think it's a really interesting question and something we all were very worried about at the onset of the pandemic when we all thought all our COPD and asthma patients were gonna be at very, very high risk, uh, whether they were World Trade Center or not World Trade Center. And interestingly, I think what the data is starting to show is that both the COPD and the asthma patients can get COVID, that happens. Uh, they should all get vaccinated all the time, that's true. Uh, but the COPDers tend to be at higher risk for severe outcomes compared with the asthma. And there was a whole question about were the asthma patients actually a little bit protected because they were using inhaled corticosteroids or because of something in their pathways particularly with IL-13, for example. And I think that that's panning out to some extent that um, the asthma patients certainly can get COVID, they can certainly get sick, um, but the data are suggesting that they may do a little bit better that's different than the COPDers who are at very, very high risk. Um, I can't speak to long COVID because I think long COVID is such a complicated issue how we define it, who gets it. And I think certainly these are studies that are ongoing. Thank you. Um, next question that I have, you mentioned that 9-11 dust exposures coupled with the increased respiratory demand seen during rescue and recovery work led to heavy impacts on both the upper and lower airways. Among patients who presented with World Trade Center cough syndrome were most of them shown to be asthmatics. So what we're seeing in my population is that, um, no, they're not always asthmatics. Um, a lot of these patients, as we said, have, have other comorbid conditions. And a lot of the coughing can sometimes be attributed to their rhinosinusitis, um, their GERD, or, or even other uh, lung disorders. A lot of these patients have evidence of um, Earway inflammation and CT imaging, such as uh, ear trapping and bronchial wall thickening. 
So um, the short answer is uh, no, not, not all the patients with the cough have asthma, but a significant proportion of them do. So. I think it's a very important question because you have to think always about your differential diagnosis of cough, right? Thinking about is it upper airway, is it lower airway, and which disease is it? Um, and I think the other important thing is, as, as the questioner mentioned, we know that there was so much dust uh, and that the dust overwhelmed many of the normal protective mechanisms that one would have. Because we know that usually large particles end up in the upper airway, smaller particles can end up in the lower airway, but that because of the massive amount, we were able that, that many of these particles ended up in the lower airway. And we know that from um, studies that have been published uh, looking at biopsy and lung lavage and even sputum samples of uh, responders and uh, also of survivors. So this was a very weird exposure, all of which can cause cough, but there's many, many reasons someone can have cough. And so it is really important to make sure that we always think about our differential diagnosis. Whether they had asthma or not, there are, again have been studies looking at, are they hyper-responsive doing methacholine challenges? And Many are and some aren't. So again, you just have to think of your differential diagnosis over, uh, all the time. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what lessons in asthma management have been learned that perhaps can be applied to asthma management among persons exposed to future disasters? So I'll take that, uh, Denise, quickly. I think... Sure. And again, we learned this in a way from the firefighters, right, who were put on an inhaled corticosteroid right away. And the interesting thing is that that was a really important maneuver. And I think it's important for us to understand and what I'm trying to reinforce, too, as we think about asthma now, which is that many of these patients have low, uh, have inflammation. And if we can prevent that inflammation from progressing or from getting worse, that maybe we can progress development of disease or certainly maybe exacerbations of disease. So I would say our thinking now is that we would like to inhibit inflammation. Now, there are different types of inflammation and inhaled corticosteroids really are effective against certain types. There may be others that are not as effective, but we don't actually have great treatments for those right now. So I think our, our, our story is really, inhaled corticosteroids are pretty good for you <laughs> if you have airways disease. Thank you. But I also think it's important to, to, to note that it's like, um, like the non world trade center asthmatics, it's important to note that um, other factors besides um, the immune response may play a role. And so we have to have a multi-system multi approach to the treatment, just like we do with asthmatics not exposed to the world trade center population. Thank you. Thank you both doctors for your presentation. I will transfer it now to Dr. Kelvert and go ahead and share my screen for the continuing education credits information. Okay, thank you, Anne. So I recommend that you take a screenshot of the, the slide that Anne's gonna present because it's got information that you're gonna need to, to, to claim these continuing education credits. So yeah, please take a screenshot. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's continuing education credits for many different health disciplines, including physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, physician assistants, and uh, certified public health professionals. So you'll need to go to the, the TRAIN website. The link is on this screen. And when you go to the TRAIN website, probably the simplest way to find the course would be to type in WC4740. And that will bring up uh, the, a couple of courses, one of which is the asthma course. Or if you want the actual specific, only the specific asthma course to show up, you could type in that date, the WC4740-02-1524, which is today's date. And then once you select that, it's going to ask you for uh, access or registration code, which is WTCHP, World Trade Center Health Program. You only need that for the live webinar. Uh, and then if you're watching the recording of this, uh, this, will be, th this webinar was recorded. It'll be on YouTube probably within two to four weeks. And so if you, show, if you view the, the recording, you'll need to, again, go to train and go to the uh, find the, uh, 
the recorded course using WD, WD as in dog 4740. So once you log in, find the course, you'll need to complete the post test. There's gonna be four questions. You'll have two chances to complete the post test. And then after you've completed the post test, you'll be asked to evaluate the webinar. And then you'll get your continuing education credits. So I think with that, that's, that's oh yeah, thank you. We do have, I uh, want to announce our next webinar, which is going to be on interstitial lung diseases. So it's an encore performance by Dr. Delahose, Dela excuse me, Dr. Delahose, who gave the chronic rhinosinusitis webinar back uh, earlier this month. So he'll be doing the, the uh, webinar on diagnosis and treatment of interstitial lung diseases on Thursday, February 29th, so leap day. Uh, and again, it will be at noon. So hopefully you can attend that and we'll be sending out the invitations for that, hopefully by early next week. And with that, thank you for spending your, your lunch hour with us and spending your time. And thanks again to our, our great speakers, Drs. Reibman and Harrison. Thank you so much for, for uh, dedicating this time and, and your dedication to, to the members in the program. So with that, we'll be signing off. Thank you very much.